The League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan organization formed to encourage citizen participation in government. It never supports or opposes any political party or candidate. The statements and opinions of the candidates are presented solely in the interest of public service and in no way are to be construed as an endorsement thereof by the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters takes no responsibility for the views or facts stated by the candidates. The audio or video from the forum may not be used in or for commercial advertising. This presentation is copyrighted by the League of Women Voters. All rights are reserved. This video may only be shown in its entirety. Good evening and welcome to this forum for Rochester Community School Board of Education. The forum is featuring the eight candidates who have filed for the Rochester Schools Community Board. There are six candidates running for a six-year term and three candidates for the four-year term. Can, I'm sorry, four candidates running for a term ending in December 31, 26. Vote for two. The League of Women Voters Oakland area is the sponsor of this forum. I am Jerry Burden, a member of the League of Women Voters. I am not a resident of this district. The League of Women Voters is a trusted, national, nonpartisan political organization. Our members do the hands-on work to safeguard democracy while we never endorse any candidate or political party. We are engaged in the important issues that keeps our community strong. As a leader, as a League of Women Voters member, I have the opportunity to contribute in a leadership role such as this that has great impact on local, state, and even national issues. If you're interested in joining, you may join the League of Women Voters. It's open to men and women over the age of 16. Visit our website, lwvoa.org. The League of Women Voters did not endorse any candidate or political party. Views expressed in this forum are of the candidates and the sponsors take no responsibility. The format for this forum has been established by the League of Women Voters. We ask that the audience remain silent during the forum. Please turn off all cell phones. We ask the candidates answer the questions of their views only and not interrupt another candidate. Questions and ask of all candidates and do not single out any one candidate. This presentation is copyrighted 2024 by the League of Women Voters. All rights are reserved. All candidates will answer the questions submitted by the audience, screened for duplication and appropriateness by Cindy Pelleton. We have pages passing out cards and pencils. And if you want to write a question, raise your hand, they'll get you a card and a pencil. All candidates have been given one minute for opening statements in alphabetical order. Closing statements will be one minute in reverse order. Candidates will have one minute to answer each question unless extended by the moderator. All candidates will be allowed time to answer questions. Our timer, Pat Kish, will indicate when it's time, 15 seconds left and when time to stop. And if you're in the middle of a sentence, I will let you finish. We're not gonna, we're not gonna cut anybody off on, if they're in the end of a sentence, we're not gonna cut them off. The candidates for the six-year term are Julie Ospa, Jason Blake, Tara Dada Donnelly, Richard J. Kazasinski, Kazanowski, I'm sorry, Shelley Luzon. Candidates for the other term are Barbara Annis, Michelle Butel, Jonathan Cece, and Andrew Weaver. Vote for two. We will begin our one-minute opening statements with Mrs. Osba. Good evening. 
and thank you to the League of Women Voters and all the people that have come out today. My name is Dr. Julie Alspa, and I currently sit on the board and I'm running for a six-year term. I'm running because all students deserve the challenging learning opportunities that RCS gives our students. And to me, all means all. All students should feel safe in our schools, be represented in our books, and represented in our curriculum. I believe we must support all students' dreams, whether they're college, skilled trades, or military service. I am a graduate of Rochester Schools, as are my three children. I have been a student, a parent, a student teacher, a long-term sub, and a coach in RCS. In my professional career includes a second grade teacher, a special education teacher, and I'm currently the executive director for the Human Resource Department in a public school. My experience gives me a unique experience that I can bring to the board, so remember that All SPA stands for All Kids. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blake. Thank you to the League and everyone watching. My name is Jason Blake. I just finished one year of service to this board and I'm seeking a full six-year term. I'm an attorney, I'm a U of M grad twice, and I'm the father of a child who just started fourth grade in our district. He's my whole life and I want his school years to be everything they can, academically, socially, all of it. And I want that for all kids in this district. That's what led me to join the school board. In the past year, I've learned so much about the district, all the many ways that it excels. I've also learned we have some opportunities to improve. Make no mistake, though, RCS is not a district in decline. It is a district in transition. We have a new strategic plan, a new superintendent, a lot of people in new roles. It's an exciting time for our district. I'm focused on that bright future. I think I have the right skill set and the right mindset to serve this school board well for the next six years, and I hope I can earn your vote on November 5th. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. Good evening, my name is Tara Dada Donnelly and I'm running for the six year term on the RCS school board. I'm a lifelong resident and a proud RCS alum. My RCS teachers did an excellent job of preparing me for the academic rigor of the chemical engineering program at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Current RCS students should receive the same world class education that I did. However, RCS is currently facing challenges that need attention, so I'm running for three primary reasons. First, to ensure academic growth for learners of all abilities, ranging from students with IEPs and 504s to advanced learners and gifted students. Two, to provide more proactive budget oversight to mitigate the risk of the financial shortfalls that other school districts experienced in recent years. And three, to improve the relationship between the school board and the community. I'm a retired engineer with an MBA who has the skills to help solve problems from the past and the experience to provide a vision for the future. I hope to earn your consideration and your vote over the course of this forum. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Kazanowski. Hello, my name is Richard Kazanowski and I'm running for the school board because I believe in the power of education to transform lives. As a US Army veteran and a dedicated public servant with over 30 years of experience, I've advocated for at-risk children and families at Oakland County Children's Village, ensuring that every child has access to the support they need to succeed. I'm proud to say that my two sons are both graduates of Rochester schools and are now teachers themselves, which gives me a unique insight into the challenges and opportunities our schools face today. With a degree in psychology and a business minor, I bring a balanced perspective that values both student well-being and fiscal responsibility. As a champion of public schools, I'm committed to creating a safe, inclusive environment where every student can thrive. I believe in collaboration, transparency, and empowering educators to do what they do best. Together, we can ensure our schools are places where every child feels valued and inspired to learn. Thank you for considering me for the board. I would be honored to serve our community and all its students. Thank you, Ms. Luzon. Hi everybody, thank you League of Women Voters for coming tonight and all of everybody in the audience. Uh, my name is Shelly Lozon and I am a wife and a mother of three girls, two are in the district and my third will be joining next year. I have a bachelor's degree in business administration with experience in HR, accounting, office management, sales and customer service. I'm running for the six year term because I'm concerned about the overall district direction, particularly regarding the future of all the children. I believe that meaningful change takes place at the local level and the schools are essential in shaping the value and skills of our next generation. Instead of standing by and watching these questionable changes unfold, I decided to take action by running to represent those who share similar concerns. 
The children are our future, and it's important that they receive a quality education that prioritizes academic excellence. I want to ensure every child in our district has access to the resources, support, and opportunities they need to succeed, whether they are heading to college, trade school, or directly into the workforce. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sanis. Good evening, I'm Barb Annis, and I currently serve as the Vice President of the Board of Education and I'm seeking re-election to a two-year term. I believe in the value of public schools. I serve to ensure that the same high-quality education my own two children, both RHS graduates, received continues for future generations. I've lived in this community for 27 years. Prior to beginning my service in 2017 and re-election in 2018, I'd been involved in the school district for 21 years through numerous PTA leadership roles locally as well as at a state level and on a citizens committee that helped successfully pass a millage renewal and a $185 million bond that invested taxpayer dollars back into our public schools. I believe it's important to advocate for public schools as a professional graphic designer. I am also a firm believer in the value of the arts in a child's education. I'm proud to have the endorsement of the educators and the support staff of RCS, and I thank the League for hosting and look forward to answering questions this evening. Thank you, Ms. Butel. First, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight. I'm Michelle Butel, and I'm running for re-election because I'm passionate about the RCS district and our community. I'm currently on the board serving as president, and I'm seeking another two-year term. I bring civility and stability, as well as a student-centered and future-focused approach to the board. I'm committed to supporting staff and our new superintendent as we implement our new strategic plan. I raised two children who graduated from RCS with my husband of 30 years who recently passed away. I have a BA and MBA from the University of Michigan and a background in operations and financial processes. I've served the Rochester community for over 20 years, first through involvement in my children's school and then through the district. I'm also involved in the greater community through Neighborhood House, Raya, and my church. I'm honored to have earned the support and endorsement of our teachers, support staff, and parent pros, and I hope to earn your vote as well. Thank you, Mr. Cece. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, League of Women Voters, for the invite. I'm Jonathan Sessi, and as a parent of four children in Rochester Community Schools, I am deeply invested in ensuring each child receives the exceptional education they deserve. Children are the heartbeat of our schools, and it's our duty to provide them with a safe, enriching environment. Transparency is key as parents need to trust that what their children are learning aligns with their values and taxpayers trust how district funds are being utilized. While our district excels in many areas, we've lost our way in others, like wasteful spending, widening the communication gap between parents and teachers, and using curricula that don't fully serve students. I'm running for board trustee to bring our focus back to academic rigor transparency in classrooms and at the administrative level, and efficient use of funds to restore confidence among parents, students, and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. I'm Andrew Weaver. Uh, thank you for everyone coming out and being engaged in the process. That's very important. Um, I'm running for re-election to another two-year seat. I ran two years ago, and this doesn't get any easier. Um, because I found out in 2020 that there were some major issues going on, and then I learned by engaging with our community that the problems we were seeing were not caused by the pandemic, they were systemic. We have a district that is built off of decades and decades. Um, my wife is a graduate from Rochester Community Schools, and many of us moved here for the school. So in the two years that I've been on the board, we've seen what progress can be made by just asking questions. We've reduced PR spending, we've re reduced bad legal fees, and so again, I'm running to continue that process. We need to have transparent policies that rebuild trust with parents and protect our teachers. That's how we started. We need to reduce our central office spending and return that money back to the classroom. These are things that are well within the board's purview and control. And that is what I'm focused on continuing to do if reelected. Thank you. I will now read a statement from Noreen Sabah, who is not here tonight. My name is Noreen Sabah. I want to be your next Board of Education trustee for the Rochester Community Schools. 
Please excuse me tonight. There was a conflict with two events in the district that pertained to my kids. I'm a parent of three. One graduated from Rochester High School in 2020. I have two children currently in Rochester schools. I'm a PTA secretary for both Ruther and Rochester High School. As an educator, I have a vision to see the district excel in areas starting with enrollment while restoring academics and finances. I believe together we can keep politics out of the schools and the division it brings while letting kids be kids. Let's focus on the core curriculum and parents. We need your involvement and we need you to ask the questions. I love our Rochester families, our schools, teachers, and parapros. I look forward to the opportunity to serve our community. Please vote for me on November 5. For more information, please refer to my website, noreenforkids.com. Thank you, Ms. Sable. Nazreen Sabah. Sabah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we will now begin our questions from our forum, and our candidates will have one minute time limit, and we begin with Ms. Osbaugh. And the, the first question A system of public schools is mandated by the state constitution. Given the alternatives available, charter schools, private schools, religious schools, homeschooling, why is our community schools governed by public school system important? Our public school system is important because it represents our whole community. I completely respect parents that make choices to have other um, educational solutions for their children, That's but right. the public school system represents our entire community and it's where our children get exposure to all the elements of our community that is going to set them up the best for success in the future. It's where they can learn to explore and meet people and touch base with their community. So that's why I think it's very important. Thank you. Mr. Blake. So the public schools are available for all kids. We take everybody who comes within our door and we do our best to teach them and, and produce our next generation of citizens. And that's, not to say, and that's not to say people can't make other choices, but public education is kind of the great equalizer. Whatever kind of family you come from, whatever your situation, when you come into this school, you get the, the education that we provide and you are hopefully come out the other end a capable and productive citizen. And there's nothing else like that out there. All of these other options, uh, they can pick and choose. They don't have to take you. They don't have to offer special, special education services. They don't have to offer various things. So our next generation of students is coming through these schools. And it's, it's a very important community good. Thank you. Ms. Donnelly. So as somebody who actually received an excellent education in the public schools, in Rochester Community Schools in particular, um, I'm a strong believer that public schools are the backbone of any thriving community. And as Mr. Blake said, um, they're the great equalizer. Um, I'm somebody who benefited greatly from a public school education. And I quite frankly wouldn't be sitting here today um, with the, you know, the honor of running for the school board if I hadn't graduated with the excellent education that I received from my RCS teachers. I was able to go to the University of Michigan and get a chemical engineering and succeed because my teachers prepared me so well. And had I stayed, I mean, I don't mean to knock another school district, but had I stayed in a different school district, I would not be sitting here today. So, I, you know, it's personal for me. I owe a debt of gratitude to the public schools and I will continue to defend them. Thank you. Mr. Kazanowski. Uh, I'm a huge champion of the public schools. Uh, I'm a product of the public schools. I went through Warren Consolidated, and frankly, that was uh, the one thing that really made my college career very easy, having excellent teachers and things like that. But collectively, working as a social worker, even at Children's Village, but public schools are truly the safety net for every single kid in our community. And obviously, our public schools got to reflect the values of every single kid in our community. We got to make sure we address the needs of all the kids, we identify all of them, we make sure that they're heard, their voices are important. And we have a ton of services that aren't necessarily offered in the charter schools and some of the private schools. So 
You know, my, both my sons are graduates from Rochester schools. They had a great experience. They were honestly overly prepared going to Michigan State and Michigan and Central and OU. So I know the powerful impact of public education and truly it is a bedrock of democracy. I honestly believe that and I think we need to have strong education, public education moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luzon. I'm also a product of public schools. Um, public schools are very important because education, the intent is to equip these students with critical thinking skills and the ability, the, the ability to understand various viewpoints, preparing them for life after school. Um, we, there are many options that kids can take after school. Not everybody is going to college. So schools are amazing because, you know, we have trade schools, people going, kids going directly into the workforce, we have military, it, it all varies. So schools definitely, are important because they give each child the resources that they need and the opportunities that they need to succeed. And that is why schools are important. Thank you, Ms. Annis. I too am a product of public education and I believe that it's a public good and it's a community's promise in our collective future. And it is, as I believe uh, someone here said, it's the great equalizer. Um, specifically here in our district and in the state of Michigan, uh, we are, uh, we being public school systems, are uh, tasked with educating children up to the age of 26. And I'm proud to say in Rochester Community Schools, uh, we have developed the adult transition program, which meets the needs of some of our most, um, uh, our students with the different abilities. Um, but every child, regardless of race, religion, has an opportunity to exceed and, success, and it's excel um, in public schools. Thank you, Ms. Putel. Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I too am a product of public schools, and I think public schools are one of the things that really makes the United States stand out. We offer a free education to every child within our borders, and um, with that comes the exposure to a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives, and it provides a greater sense of community as well. Uh, with community schools, we live together, we attend school together, and it brings us together. And specifically when we talk about Rochester community schools, when we talk about the community is in there for a reason. Um, we are part of the community. People move to this area because of the schools. We prepare our students to be productive citizens, and we know that they return, often return, to raise their families in Rochester as well. Um, so just in conclusion, um, the role of public education within our community and our country is uh, just, Your time is up. thank you. Mr. Cece. So the reason why public schools are important is because they are for everyone. Um, they provide a vast array of options for students of all walks of life. And it's extremely important that, um, th th that these options are available for, for free. Um, not everybody can afford private schools. Um, and they may not have the ability to homeschool. So in order to cater to the vast majority of our, um, our community, we must make sure that our public schools stand strong and are, they have great options available. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Public schools are the absolute clearest form of equal opportunity. That is what public schools are. They provide the equal opportunity to an education. What we acknowledge though is not all districts are equal. As someone that attended two very different schools, one in Jackson, Michigan, and one outside of LA in California, those experiences are very different. But again, they're still an equal opportunity to an education. The concern that I have with our, in Rochester, is every parent has the right to make a decision to take their kids out of the room. That's why school of choice is out there and available. We are seeing parents take it at a higher rate currently, and that scares me of why are people not choosing the great opportunity to provide that Rochester has historically offered. The data shows us that more parents are choosing to take their students outward, and we have to get those students back. So again, when we offer the, when we talk about equal opportunity, our opportunity is above other, other districts. And so we have to correct why parents are choosing to take their kids otherwise while still paying taxes. Thank you. 
Next question, we'll start with Mr. Blake. Educational outcomes and accountability. How can the board create a positive culture of accountability that promotes the best possible outcomes academically for every child? Well, the board is focused, has been focused on this recently. We just had a four hour work session last night where we went over all of our uh, enrollment, or I'm sorry, all of our uh, testing data. And we keep, uh, we keep up on that. We did have a drop this year, but we've had a meeting, we've discussed it, we've gone through it as, with a fine tooth comb. And we, need to, and we need to do that. We need to do that, we do that periodically and we need to keep on top of that, making sure that all of the, the benchmarks, whether it's the testing scores, whether it's graduation rates, whether it's college acceptance, whether it is uh, how many of our students go on to other, uh, the, the trades, et cetera, we need to keep that data and keep on top of it and constantly make sure that we're meeting the uh, requirements of the students of the district. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. So, you know, I also attended the meeting last night and um, for me, as somebody with a project management background, I really think that we need more regular reviews of performance data. Um, in the board meetings, more than the, the frequency that they are occurring. Um, I personally would have an action plan that covers, you know, assessment, instruction, intervention, and pretty much at every work session have regular updates about that. And with respect to assessment, kind of breaking it down into um, test scores, which is one metric, but also teacher assessment, which to me, you know, the test scores kind of give you a collective idea of how the district as a whole is performing. And the um, teacher assessments would give you an individualized plan and how you're doing. Um, and I see I'm running out of time. I could go on this forever. But, um, you know, with respect to uh, instruction, um, we have to make sure we're picking evidence-based curriculums. And with respect to intervention, we also need to make sure that the intervention aligns with the instruction curriculums we're choosing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kazanowski. Uh, in regard to test scores, I'd say some of the things that we probably need to do is enhance teacher support and professional development. We got to make sure our teachers have all the updated tools of the trade to have the best outcomes so our kids have the best outcomes. We got to implement targeted interventions for our struggling students, whether that's mentoring or additional support or tailoring the, the educational needs to each student. We got to have a collaborative school culture that encourages teamwork among the teachers, parents, and the community members. I think we need to emphasize social and emotional learning. When students feel safe and supported, they're more likely to see, succeed academically. And I think lastly, we gotta leverage our data effectively. Analyzing student performance can identify trends in areas of improvement so we can adjust our strategies promptly. So, thank you. Ms. Luzon. Could you repeat the question? Educational outcomes and accountability. How can the board create a positive culture of accountability that promotes the best possible outcome academically for the whole child? So I really think it comes down to communication um, and involvement. I think we should conduct regular surveys, engage the students, um, especially during and after graduation. You know, were they prepared? What were they missing? I, I, we really, you know, social media is right at our fingertips. We could use that as a great chain of communication to get co input from the community, every, every stakeholder. Um, we need to just keep everybody, I wouldn't say ahead in a sense, but we need to look at our schools and, and look at other schools that are doing better than us and be like, okay, what are they doing right and what can we do to fix? Because you know, while we are leading in, in certain areas, we're not leading by much. Um, and we need to be setting the standard for neighboring districts and not just stay a little bit ahead. So communication and involvement of everybody would be key. Thank you, Ms. Annis. So, <clears throat> excuse me, a positive uh, culture for um, encouraging the best pos possible outcomes for our students begins at the top. It begins at the board table. And that begins through supporting our administrators and our teachers and our educators that are doing the work in the classroom. 
Uh, currently, we have a strategic plan in place that entails projects that focus on uh, specific co focus areas. One of them is actually learning. And um, that particular fo focus area in learning is now piloting um, five different, um, at five different elementary schools, um, new, leading, new literacy initiatives to help our students uh, because we've, we've seen in the data that that is necessary for our elementary students. Um, giving our teachers, again, the supports that they need to do the job in the classroom and continuing to ensure that when we look at data, if we have to make changes, that we're doing so uh, in real time so that it can impact the kids that we're teaching. Thank you. Mr. Cece. I'm sorry, Ms. Butel. Thank I you. Missed one here. Um, well, I think that uh, culture is established by having a partnership between staff and parents and the board so that we are working cooperatively collaboratively um, to set that accountability. I think you also have to have um, a growth mindset and the thought process that as parents and staff and students that we can always get better, that there is continuous improvement. Um, and then going back to how Mr. Blake talked about um, discussing the not only the, um, like the MSTEP and the SAT, but also the iReady information that comes out three times a year, um, the class assessments, so that we can get a whole picture of where we might have areas of improvement, and then specifically identifying those areas to improve upon. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Cece. I'm going to ask you to repeat that question one more time, if you don't That's mind. That's all right. Educational outcomes and accountability. How can the board create a positive culture of accountability that promotes the best possible outcome academically for the children? Well, I think my short answer is to make sure that we're con continuing to foster a culture of uh, communication with the parents and guardians of the children that are at our schools. We need to we need to make sure that um, we are open to insight from the parents so that we know um, how their children are doing outside of school and that way we can keep things rolling smoothly within the schools. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. So the board's role is to oversee the district from a standpoint, and ultimately the superintendent. So when we start this question, it's about setting smart metrics for the superintendent. As someone that's married to a public high school teacher, teachers get metrics that they're held accountable to, but they don't see that cascaded up to the central office. So the board has to accept that responsibility and set the metrics at the top of what we expect from the superintendent, and then those should roll down and do tangible metrics all the way down. Because the decline we're seeing in our SAT scores has happened over the course of a decade. It didn't happen yesterday, and it would be shameful to act like we're gonna ask teachers to fix it tomorrow. So again, we wanna foster that inclusion, and it's about getting everyone into the right roles and responsibilities. Because we often hear about parents' rights, but ultimately the outcome of students is a parent's responsibility as well. The school has to provide the opportunity and the resources, but parents have to buy into that and hold up their end of the bargain. So again, it's clear expectations, clear standards at the top of the district, and making sure we have the resources down and empower everyone below the districts, both teachers and parents. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Ms. Donnelly. The school district budget, I'm sorry, Ms. Allsbach, I forgot all about you over there on the end. That's all right. Um, so a positive culture of, of accountability begins with an open discussion focused on data inquiry that's free of political agendas, that incorporates all of our stakeholders and puts the students at the center of all of our decisions. When we look at outcomes, one of the powerful tools that our teachers have is the iReady assessment. And one of the reasons that this test is such a valuable indicator of outcomes is it talks about student growth with the same cohort of students in the same group of class with that same teacher. And as we do this test three different times a year, we not only get diagnostics about what domain that child needs, we also get them measure their growth. So students that are on track, we want a year of growth. Students that are behind, we actually want to try to get more than a year of growth. So our teachers are able to look at that data and customize the instruction, which is one of the things our teachers do very well. And at the board, we hear constantly about their interventions and their advocating and the way that they're improving their instruction. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll start with Ms. Donnelly. 
The school district budget is a tool to achieve district goals and deliver positive outcomes for students. Please tell us what skills you bring to the board to make the best use of its resources. Wow, thank you for to whoever asked that question. Um, I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, my background is um, from an education perspective. I have an MBA where I focused on financial statement analysis and developing business cases and examining return on investments. Um, as, a, as an engineer who also has an MBA, I also worked in engineering, manufacturing, and marketing. Um, I have been a project manager for multi-million dollar um, projects in the automotive industry, and I could definitely bring um, additional oversight with respect to the um, $236 million budget that the board is required to oversee. So, um, you know, I, I feel that my skill set definitely matches the, um, the budget oversight role of a school board trustee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kazanowski. So my experience with budgeting is I'm a, I'm a, I got a business minor. I think I got like seven classes that help. Turn your mic on. Excuse me, thank you. I'm a, uh, well, as a business minor, I had like seven classes in accounting. I decided to go in another direction, which was psychology, but I'm kind of a math nerd. But I do know a couple things about budgets. I ran a 64-unit apartment complex running the entire budget for uh, all those units. But we do know that revenues cannot exceed expenses. And I think the district's been doing a pretty good year, uh, job over the last several years. We've gotten a lot of awards for our financial accounting and illiteracy. I trust we have a lot of great experts that are continuing to do that. Part of my role is to monitor those expenses to make sure that they don't exceed our budget, that we stay within our margins. I think those are important things. So analyzing all that stuff on a regular basis, making sure we're not slipping through the cracks. I do hope that Rochester continues in that trend. And I do trust with what's gone on the last seven years that will continue that way. So I would say I'm just going to monitor closely and look at all that and make sure that they're held accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Luzon. I have a business degree in, uh, or a bachelor's degree, I'm sorry, in business administration. I had, do have direct personal experience with human resources, accounts payable, accounts receivable, office management, sales, and customer service. Uh, the role of a trustee is to represent the community and provide oversight of finances, setting policies, making decisions with the best interest of the students and our community. So while I do have young children, uh, which offers me a wonderful understanding into the needs of families, my business background does provide skills required for financial and operational oversight of the school district. Thank you, Ms. Annis. Thank you. So uh, the skill set I bring as a graphic designer uh, who freelances uh, professionally for me, myself, and I is uh, working with clients, uh, developing budgets, um, developing contracts, but also a uh, part of that is collaboration, listening to understand, creativity, and attention to detail. Um, it's also important to recognize that um, if you are serving with six other, seven other people, or six other people, I should say, um, it's good to understand that we all bring certain skill sets and strengths to uh, the board table. So um, I'm proud to say I've served next to this woman to my left, who has for years done a great job. Um, but since we've served on the board together, we've um, delivered a balanced budget every year gotten rid of our line of credit, refinanced our bonds uh, for taxpayer savings of over a million dollars, and increased our rainy day fund from 10 to 18 percent. And we have a track record, uh, RCS does, of the Meritorious Budget Award, which is the most prestigious recognition of public school districts that they can receive for business officials. Thank you. Ms. Butel. Hi. Um, I have a master's of business administration, um, which did focus on uh, dealing with finances and budgets. I also have work experience in operations and dealing with finances, uh, proce financial processes and budgeting. Um, in addition, I've been on the board uh, for the last almost eight years, so we've dealt with um, the budget planning cycle as well. and. I'm very analytical and organized, and the important piece here is to focus on um, the positive outcomes for students. And I think the 
more that we can um, identify budget items that are closest to our students, the better we do in serving that. And that's a continual improvement that happens year over year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cece. So my experience comes from uh, 15 years of business owner, <coughs> excuse me, business owner and operator experience. Um, I oversaw the day-to-day -day operations for the full 15 years of a small business. So I was exposed to um, management of people, um, management of funds, um, dealing with the public was uh, not very easy. So I've developed a thick skin for that. Um, and I also had the, um, the luxury of assisting my wife in homeschooling our kids for a couple of years. So I have some at-home classroom experience that I think would be valuable as a board member. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. You Certainly. The school district budget is a tool to achieve district goals and deliver positive outcomes for students. Please tell us the skills you bring to help guide the district to make the best uses of its resources. So my professional background is, again, I actually got my undergrad in political science and history. I went out and got my master's in lean manufacturing. I've worked in the retail industry. I've worked in the financial industry. Now I work in the automotive industry. Um, and each one of those in a people lead a role and ultimately have to be responsible for budgets and departments. So I think just that skill set and policy and procedure, but really it comes down to the lean manufacturing side of it, which we can apply. We need to make sure that we're as lean as possible in what are our non-value added jobs. And I know that's offended some people sometimes, so I just wanna take a second to explain that. In manufacturing, value added is who is closest to the, out, the outcome, which in our case in education would be our teachers, our classrooms. That is where we need to make sure that we are directing as many funds to that part. We need to be as lean as possible in our central office. The example you see is in higher education. We, have to, we can have that as a model to see where we've seen the bloating and bureaucracy. We have to reduce that and get more of the money back to those that add value. And again, that is in our classrooms. Thank you, Ms. Alspa. So school budgets are a highly specialized type of funding. We get most of our funding through a pupil allowance. But lately in our trends, we've seen that more and more is coming through grant funding. I am unique in this position in that I have run school programs, I have run special education budgets, and I'm aware of a lot of the constraints and a lot of the requirements for grant funding as I write grants in my own day job. So those understanding how that financial piece comes together with your state aid piece, your state budget, and your grants gives me a unique perspective to understand what the opportunities are and what our administration should be doing. Thank you, Mr. Blake. So I was an attorney in private practice for over 20 years and as a partner in a law firm for majority of that time, two different law firms actually. And when you're a partner in a law firm, you only get paid if you have money left. And so you meet with the other partners and you budget and you pay the people who work for you and you pay the expenses and if you have money left, then you get it. I've also worked for most of my career on what they call mega cases, which are usually like eight, nine figure cases. And the budgets you present on those are seven, eight figures uh, that the attorneys would um, be presenting. So on the flip side, you have to present a budget to your own client. And if you don't stay within that budget, your client will fire you. Um, I now have a whole different position where I work within a company and I'm responsible for keeping our legal spend within a, a limit. I'm responsible for overseeing the, our outside firms and making sure that they keep within a, a a certain amount and I can hold them accountable and I can slash their bills or I can fire them. So this budgeting uh, is something that I'm familiar with. Thank you. Next question, we will start with Mr. Kazanowski. Board meetings are often divisive and tense. How will you bring, bridge, bridge the gap with those whom you disagree? What steps will you take to foster collaboration and meaningful discussions and build consensus? Thank you, that's a very good question. Honestly, I've been asked that question several times, but uh, you know, it appears like in our country we have this great ideological divide that's occurring. And frankly, people just don't listen to each other anymore, if you haven't noticed. And have you ever been ignored? Being ignored is never a good outcome. Generally, people get sad, they get angry. So obviously, listening is one of the you know, important skills as a board member and uh, allowing people to 
make their voices heard and being open to all that. So I also think there's a thing called rational attachment as a sitting board member in life it works in general, particularly it helped me significantly at Children's Village dealing with a lot of difficult families and children where they tend to react quite strongly. So learning how to not take things personally, to separate yourself from that, acknowledging other people's feelings. I think we also need to ask those uh, questions such as, how is it that you came to that decision? How is it that you feel that way? Instead of getting defensive and maybe explore and be a little more curious about what's really going on with that other person to help settle some of that. So I think when we listen, we acknowledge what other people are, and everybody's important. We all gotta listen to all the viewpoints. So I think that would be an important thing and it's a skill that I bring over the course of my career at 30 years at Children's Village. Thank you. Ms. Luzon. I believe it's crucial to keep in mind that everyone involved has the best interest of our district at heart, the students. We need to have respectful discussions and active listening, even if we all do not agree with each other's ideas. I will not malign the motives to those who disagree with me, but I would try to find a place where we could agree to see if that leads to some type of compromise in the areas that we don't agree with. Um, I do worry that the scars run pretty deep in the board, and I feel like the only way to move forward would to have some new representation at the board. Thank you, Ms. Butel. Um, Mrs. Annis. Oh, Ms. Annis, I'm sorry, I missed you again. No worries. So, obviously it's, it's no surprise that uh, our board has been quite contentious for the past couple of years. Um, and we've gotten strategic planning feedback that um, has expressed the community's desire to have a functional board because right now, um, in many cases, we're not functioning as a full board the way a full board should be. A lot of that is based on trust. Trust is a huge factor in board dynamics. When members aren't honest and upfront about their intentions, either online or at the board table, um, it's hard to do the board's business and trust one another to move forward. We have uh, five current board members who have demonstrated the ability to function together and to work together. We're heart-minded, we're not like-minded, and that's what we need at the board table when you have to focus and make decisions for all the students that we serve. Thank you, Ms. Butel. Well, I agree that it is important to try and get everyone to listen to each other, to uh, share their ideas, and to try to be calm during that process. Um, I believe the board has struggled over the last couple years in doing that. Um, one of the things that I would love to see as a community that I think would benefit the board is to have community roundtables where community members, administration, and board members can sit down together to in small groups and to discuss and better understand each other's um, thoughts and how they are reaching the conclusions and the ideas that they have. And my hope is that through those um, relationship building that uh, the board would be able to not only understand each other better, but the community as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cece. Well, one thing I can promise is if I'm on the board, I will never call somebody who disagrees with my opinion an extremist, a destroyer of public schools or try to affiliate them with white supremacy. But with my, uh, with my experience as a business owner, I've developed the skills and a willingness to work together with others, regardless of differing viewpoints. I understand what it means to respect and listen to others. I believe that compromise is important when making large or small decisions. I also believe that the true meaning of a negotiation is finding a win-win situation for both sides not one or the other. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. So the first part of it is the board actually has operating rules. We need to actually just follow the rules that we have. The Roberts Rules of Orders, the Parliamentary Orders, they just need to be enforced fairly firm, and consistently, and actually that conducts it. The other part is setting clear agendas that are actually targeting business goals and business related. Um, we've got to shift away from some of them, our work sessions that just become PR events and they just drag on and it's not really addressing the issues. And again, that comes from the board president's role, working with the superintendent to make sure we get the right items on there. Um, the other part about it really comes back to just addressing the issues that we have and actions have to speak louder than words. I'm 
as a candidate and as a trustee, I was proud to support Tara Donnelly to be appointed to our board, who's someone I can tell you that we disagree on almost every political issue, but politics don't belong at our table. She was right on transparency, she was right on fiscal responsibility, and she was right on accountability. And that's about working with people that you don't agree with, but ultimately bringing those voices to the table. Thank you, Ms. Alspaugh. So in order to build consensus in the board, I think one of the things we need to do is really honestly listen to the other side and understand where they're coming from and where our common ground is. We always need to put students at the center of our decision. Personally, I can tell you I've reached out to most of the candidates and had conversations with them, and I've accepted all the invitations I've been given, and I've gone out and listened to community members and tried to understand their different perspective and where they're coming from. I think as board members, we need to remain civil to each other, and we need to keep the students at the focus of our discussions, because we do all want what's best for the students in our community. Thank you. Mr. Blake. So when I was appointed to the board, I was asked a similar question, and I said, when, when you work on complex litigation, you encounter some very, com some very strong personalities. You encounter uh, lawyers who are, are the best in their field, and they're arrogant, and they're not friendly, and you have to find a way to get along. And so I felt confident that when I came on this board that I could bridge the gap between uh, the, the different, different groups. And for a while, I did make progress with that. Um, it, ha it hasn't worked out the way I had hoped, however. It's the election season right now, and, and we're really in the thick of things, and so things are really rough, and things are really emotional with people. I don't know that in the next month we're going to be able to figure this out, but once the election is over, those of us who win need to find a way to come together. And I do think that there are a lot of issues that we're not that far apart if it was just the issues. If we could cut through all of the extraneous comments that happen and just cut to the issues. There are some that we agree on. There are also professional facilitators that we could have come in, um, but everyone's pretty raw here, and I hope we can get past that. Thank you. Ms. Donnelly. Do you mind repeating the question one more time? I'm stalling. Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm kidding, um, but do you seriously mind repeating the question again? Board meetings are often div divisive and tense. How will you bridge the gap with those with whom you disagree? What steps will you take to foster collaboration and meaningful discussions and build consensus? So I do have experience working in the automotive industry, um, leading cross-functional teams. And in the Fortune 500 company, you have a lot of silo effects. So you always have manufacturing at odds with marketing. And you have to, you know, as somebody who was kind of working as a liaison between two groups, I mean, I was in some, I, the, your board meetings are like a Tuesday when you work in the assembly plant. So, uh, I mean, I haven't really been as shocked by it. I'm, I'm dismayed, though, because I expect better from, um, you know, our board members. I'm hoping that going forward we can. But the biggest thing that we need to stop doing is demonizing people who don't 100% align with you. Like, w stop assuming there is nefarious intent, intent when somebody has a different opinion from you. And I really think that the online toxicity is carrying into the board meetings, so we need to move conversations offline into face-to-face, -face because I think half the time, things that are said online would never be said face-to-face, -face, and we could find common ground and over time rebuild trust if we find common issues to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Ms. Lausanne. Board ethics and cooperation. Have you or w will you sign and abide by the code of ethics as outlined by the Board of Education bylaws and the code of cooperation for board conduct, which is read at each January and board members are asked to sign? Or will you follow confidentiality guidelines? I think the answer would be yes. Ms. Annis. So the uh, board does have a code of cooperation um, agreement that each board member, since I have been serving um, since 2017, every year annually signs uh, to agree to basic norms and decorum in terms of how we relate to one another and to the superintendent and the district that we serve. So yes, I would continue to sign that and I think it's valid. It's, it's, a, it's a smart thing to have in place for a public official. 
Thank you, Ms. Butel. Yeah, my answer is simple. I've signed it every year I've been on the board and I would continue to sign it. Thank you, Mr. Sisi. I don't know exactly what the, uh, the, the agreements entail, but I would definitely sign it, but I would also make sure that I follow what those uh, agreements require. I, I won't stray from those to maintain the professionalism that's needed at the board, at the board table. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. So to be transparent with the community, I have not signed it either year that I've served on the board. I shared with President Butel and former President uh, Bull in December before I was elected that it was very subjective and it could be weaponized. And in my term, we've seen it both weaponized by our former superintendent and our majority of our board. Um, so if reelected, I would work with the majority to actually take out the subjectivity, make it an actual code of conduct that is tangible and enforceable and then I would be happy to sign it. But as it's written right now, it's completely subjective and it just gets weaponized to be used against people that don't have opinions that fall in line with the majority of our board. Thank you, Ms. Osbaugh. I have signed the Code of Cooperation um, when I, and every January I've served. I believe this represents a spirit of collaboration and civility and professionalism and the spirit of working with all my board members, even if they have a different opinion. So I really think it's important that we sign that and we work together collaboratively and we listen to people that have differing opinions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Blake. I will sign it. I have signed it this past year um, and I followed the guidelines within it as well as the confidentiality guidelines. We receive information as a result of being a board member and it's important that we keep that to ourselves or at least for a period of time. And that's where there's been some of this dissension that's come up on the board when people haven't done that. So we need to follow the code of conduct and follow the confidentiality guidelines to keep the trust in that board. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. Um, I would have to read it before I sign it, but I'm inclined to believe that if there's nothing outlandish or um, you know scary, I would be inclined to sign it. Thank you, Mr. Kazanowski. Uh, thank you. Yeah, as a U.S. Army veteran and taking an oath to the United States Constitution, and I, you know, we all talk about responsibilities and rights. We have responsibilities to follow our, our federal laws, our state laws, our community laws, our local laws, and sometimes simple things like signing an agreement to all work together and stay within a time, within a, a parameters. And I think that's a reasonable request. And of course, I would sign that. And I think you mentioned something about confidentiality. And I think that's also a crucial piece as a board member to make sure that we keep everything in confidence. And thank you. Thank you. Next question, we will start with Ms. Annis. What role do you think social emotional learning should play in the Rochester Community Schools? So I like to say you can't teach a child until you reach a child. And every child comes to our school district um, with uh, different background, different, um, different families that they're, they're raised in. And social emotional learning is part of uh, what uh, is taught along with literacy, with math, with science, with social studies. Students who can manage frustration can learn more. Students who can manage anxiety will perform better. Students who feel safe and have a sense of belonging will more likely take healthy risks throughout their learning process. That's what we want. Um, also, having a trusted adult in the school system that um, a, a student has has shown to um, also be effective in helping children learn in that environment. And um, I'm, I'm a strong believer in social emotional learning in conjunction with the other learning that teachers provide. Thank you, Ms. Butel. Yeah, I too think that the social emotional learning is extremely important to our children. I just read today that the Department of Health and Human Services has indicated that one in five students have mental, emotional, behavioral, or developmental disorders. Um, so there's a growing health crisis there. And I feel that, um, you know, the district needs to teach our kids how to deal with um, setbacks, how to, um, whether that's in relationships or with um, their schoolwork. We need to make sure that our students are feeling 
safe and included um, because that makes such a difference in the lives of the children. And um, as Trustee Anna said, the students need to feel that way in order to be ready to learn. And so that's why it is so important, uh, not only for them to be good community citizens, but also good students. Thank you, Mr. Cece. <clears throat> so since running for board member, I've had the opportunity to speak to a, a lot of parents. Um, and they have asked me what exactly SEL is. Um, and to be quite honest, I do, I'm still learning about what it, what it is exactly. But what I do know is that any and all topics or subjects that are outside of core academic subjects like math, reading, science, history, et cetera, should be brought to parents and guardians' attention prior to being, being introduced to classes. Uh, that will give parents the opportunity to opt their child in or out as they see fit. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. I'll piggyback on that point. The first thing we have to do as a district is define what SEL is. If you talk to any teacher that's been around for some time, they'll tell you the term SEL has been around for a long time. But within the past five to 10 years, it's grown to a billion dollar industry. So again, it's become that new thing that people are making money off it. Pa Panorama, Panorama Education is a perfect example for our district. They provide surveys. We pay up over $200,000 in the last couple of years. But what's been the value from it? What do we do with the survey? No one can explain that. Since serving on the board, I've asked the direct question that Mr. Sissy brought up is for someone just to explain tangibly what is SEL, how do we do it, what do we implement, what's the benefits of it, and no one can answer that question. That's what we've got to figure out. What is it, what do we do with it, and what are we spending money on? There are studies out that are coming out that says some of these SEL programs are actually contributing to the higher mental health issues. Jonathan Hyatt is a, has a great new book out, The Anxious Generation, where were some of these things that we are overemphasizing things and focusing and ruminating. So again, we just have to have an honest conversation about what SEL is and then decide what we do with it. Thank you. Ms. Alspa. So SEL is educating socially and emotionally the child. This talks about educating that whole child so that they understand how to manage themselves through productive struggle and anxiety. They also understand how to interact with people that may be different than them or that might agree with them. Once you do that and you create a safe space for a child, then they're open to learn math and our core subjects. But if a child is worried about their safety or scared about what the person next to them is doing or doesn't understand, they're not willing, they don't have that cognitive space to take in the core subjects that we're trying to teach them. So this SEL creates a foundation for our children to go out in the world and be better adults and also be more receptive to the learning that needs to happen in the classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Blake. So I do think that social emotional learning is very important. A child needs to be seen, heard, valued in order to learn best. On my website, I, I put out that I have two main priorities, academic rigor and social emotional learning, and that you can have both. People talk about you either can have one or you can have the other, and I think the two actually work together uh, very nicely. A child can, receive, can reach their highest state of learning if they feel safe. And kids these days are going through different things than we did. The pressures that they have are different. The social media that wasn't present when we were children. And this is something that parents are demanding. It's not something that's coming from us. Our parents want more counselors. They want more mental health professionals. We don't have enough available. We recently got a grant um, so that at Brewster Elementary we could bring somebody in from Honor Health and be available for children who needed that extra social emotional support. So I believe this is essential for our students to have to reach their full potential. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. So I am somebody who absolutely believes that um, we have to balance student achievement with student wellness. I do agree with um, what Trustee Weaver said that we do need to define SEL because with that goals and metrics, you know, this isn't going to add value to anybody in the district. So for me personally, um, you know, dealing with self-esteem issues for a struggling reader, I think literacy is a critical SEL issue. I mean, if, if a kid can't read, that affects your, your self-esteem and you will, as you continue to struggle through other subjects that are impacted by poor reading habits, that will continue to deteriorate your self-esteem.
the seam. So I would put that as an action item under an SEL plan. The other thing is addressing the bullying and the bigotry in the district. I mean, right now we have practices that seem to protect the bully and the bigot instead of the victim. I mean, that, that's a huge issue. Bullying in the district will affect your student wellness. Um, the final thing is we need to teach emotional resilience so that children learn how to come back from defeat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kazanowski. Hi, I want to emphasize the critical importance of social and emotional learning, or SEL. In our schools, SEL equips students with essential skills that go beyond academics, helping them develop self-awareness, emotional regulation, empathy, and effective relationship building. In a rapidly changing world, it's not enough for students to excel in their studies. They also need the ability to navigate their emotions, work collaboratively, and respond to challenges with resilience. Research shows that students who engage in SEL are more likely to succeed academically, develop positive relationships, and contribute to a supportive school climate. Supporting SEL means investing in our students' overall well-being, which ultimately leads to healthier school environments. When students feel safe and understood, they are more likely to participate, take risks, and thrive. By prioritizing social and emotional learning, we are not only nurturing well-rounded individuals, but also fostering a brighter future for our entire community. Thank you. Mr. Luzon. So there's no denying that the kids these days have way more challenges than we have ever had before. Um, we need to support each child's individual needs. However, I don't believe it's the school's so that the school is solely responsible for this. Um, we as a district definitely need to define and have a clearer direction as to what SEL is supposed to be and what our responsibility and roles are in order to be able to provide the kids with proper um, direction and to be inclusive and provide a safe environment for them. Thank you. Next question, we will start with Ms. Butel. As a father of a young athlete, Athletic girl, I want to know your position on biological males playing girls' sports and using girls' locker rooms and restroom facilities. Well, when it comes to um, whether they can play in sports, uh, the Michigan Association, Michigan Association. Michigan High School Athletic Association has um, rules that are out there and they have a review process for identifying that. Um, as far as use of restrooms, um, again, we have the Elliott Larson Act and with each individual student who is in our school district, we work individually to come up with a game plan on um, what restrooms and locker rooms. I know we have separate facilities that can be utilized as well. Thank you, Mr. Cece. Can you repeat the question, please? As a father of a young athletic girl, I want to know your position on biological males playing girls' sports and using girls' locker rooms and restroom facilities. Well, that question really resonates with me because I have three young daughters, and my answer is a hard no. Mr. Weaver. So the question is about Title IX. I 100% support the original intent of Title IX. It was put in place for a reason. I'm of a generation that we know our, grand our grandmothers did not have those rights. We saw some of our mothers get those rights. We saw our sisters and aunts our sisters really explore during those rights and grow in those, I'm not going to be the one to look at my daughter and say those rights went away. Within our with policies and procedures, we can absolutely set up where we do not discriminate. We have to make sure we provide a restroom for students. When it comes to sports, sports have been defi divided by biology for a reason, and they should continue to be that way. That's unequivocal. There's no question that there's a reason that there's been biological separation in sports. So again, if others want to kick the can to another agency, our board can set policy for our district tomorrow, and it's worth the community noting that our district has adopted the new Biden administrations, but they didn't do it at the board like other districts are doing. Thank you, Ms. Allspaugh. 
So we need to make sure that we are following everyone's rights. We need to make sure we're following Title IX and advocating for women in the rights of sports, but we also need to make sure that we're following the Elliott Larson Act and that traditionally marginalized people feel safe in our schools. You know, this is an incredibly personal um, story for me because I've seen students transition in schools and they did not want to play sports. They just wanted to be safe and they just wanted to learn. So I think we need to follow the rules and we need to take this on an individual basis and remember that all children deserve to feel safe and supported in their schools. Mr. Blake. So I have been clear that I support all our students and that includes our LGBT students, which includes the T part of it. We need to come to this discussion with a baseline of respect for the trans students, not this fear or disgust that I hear from some. As to the sports, we do adhere to the NS NHSAA guidelines, which I looked them up. Uh, the trans boys, which are born female, can play on boys' teams, just like girls can play on boys' teams. As to the trans girls, which are born boys, they do that by a case-by-case -case basis. They have to seek a waiver and go through a process. And the most recent data I could find, there were 11 waiver requests in five years in the state of Michigan. And those 11 requests actually only covered seven children. So this is less than two, per, two children per year that this even comes up with in the state of Michigan. Uh, but that's the process that we go through. Uh, I will say this though, as far as locker rooms, um, I wish that there was a way that we could just refigure the, reconfigure the whole locker room situation because there are a lot of people who are uncomfortable in locker rooms for body image reasons and all, all, of other, all kinds of other reasons. So I would like to look at that. Not because of trans kids though. Thank you. Ms. Donnelly. So you said much of what I was gonna say about the, the uh, locker rooms. Um, with respect to locker rooms, I mean, th this is two different situations to me. So with respect to locker rooms, I mean, I don't understand why we don't make an investment. We spend money on things like a $40,000 sign. Um, why don't we reallocate budget towards making sure that both cis and trans students have their privacy respected in the bathrooms and go to uh, unisex bathrooms like we see at, you know, like a Barnes and Noble where everybody can have their own individual restroom and they can maintain, you know, safety and privacy in that situation. I, I think that's what we really need to go to. As far as sports, you know, I'm conflicted about that because, you know, I'm hearing information, but I'm inclined to say, you know, for sports, I, 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 I have a really rough time with, with, with I, I just have a really rough time with the sports situation. I'm open to learning more, but I'm gonna have to say no on, on, on trans um, students playing sports so not, not playing sports in general, but by biology, you know, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kazanowski. Uh, so clearly this is a pretty complex issue we're dealing with, and honestly, the, the numbers are pretty low, but of those that are actually looking to play in their non-biological sport. So, you know, again, we gotta defer to what the rules stated by the MHSAA. We gotta look at the Elliott Larson Act, which was, you know, created in 1976, I believe, by. And Ms. Elliott, who was a Democrat out of Detroit, and Larson, who was a, Dem a Republican out of Oxford, signed by Governor Milliken, who is a Republican. So making sure that we meet the needs of all of our students, I think, are extremely important. In regards to the, the bathroom issue, you know, the truth is, I think both bathrooms sometimes are operable by both sexes. Like, we have a big weekend event at Rochester. I know my son, when he wrestled there, sometimes we had wrestlers in the girls' bathroom because there was no girls on site. So there was some all the boys were sharing both both of the facilities. So having those services available for both kids in both facilities kind of makes sense to me. Like we got all the big cheerleading crew in the locker room and they can use both the boys and girls locker room. So it makes it easy for them so they can have their needs met in whatever locker room they're at. So anyhow, I guess, you know, we need to make sure we have, uh, you know, kids need to feel comfortable. We got a male bathroom, a female bathroom. Maybe we got a bathroom that just uh, is unisex. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Luzon. So we have fought for years for women's rights and fairness. So no, I do not support men in women's sports or locker rooms or bathrooms of that matter. Thank you, Ms. Annis. So we absolutely want every student uh, to feel safe in our schools and uh, to reiterate what some of my uh, current board colleagues have said. As a district, we follow MHSAA uh, guidelines for sports 
and for our student engagement in the sports. Um, and we have and we will adhere to all state and federal laws to protect students. And that includes the state level Elliott Larson Act. Thank you. Uh, the next question will start with Mr. Sisi. Do you support book banning? Why or why not? I do not support book banning, but deciding what kinds of books are appropriate for kids is the responsibility of the parent or legal guardian. If a teacher wishes to introduce a book or another student wishes to bring in a book, parents of the class should be notified before it is read aloud. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Setting standards is not book banning. Having standards in place is not book banning. So that false narrative has been around for going on two years now. We've heard book banning. No one's banning books. Um, Again, I've introduced a controversial materials policy, which the majority of our board is not willing to entertain. It has been adopted in other districts. I've added language in it that a lawyer actually recommended after the fact. So again, the language was what they were looking for to make it clear. It basically says we are gonna be transparent with what we're doing. We can actually touch third rail items, but we're gonna be transparent about it. It's gonna be done age appropriately. And again, it has educational value. But the whole narrative that we even started this question with, but banning books, no one is banning books. As a getting married to a language arts teacher, it's clear they understand that certain books have never been allowed in our schools. And so why would they be allowed now? So again, we want standards for our classrooms, standards for our libraries, clear expectations that are communicated to everybody, and we move forward. Thank you. Ms. Osma. So I grew up, uh, my father was a writer, um, and my first degree is in teaching English literature, and I was a high school English teacher. So I really do love books, and I know that they can be great places for us to have discussions, teachers to have discussions, and parents to have discussions to open our students' minds. Um, I believe that books should always be selected based on their value to the curriculum. They should be always age appropriate, and parents should know what we're talking about and reading about in schools, and they should be included in those conversations so that when our child comes home wondering, and oh, we had this great discussion, the parent can engage in that. But these books, they can be windows that help the children see into other people's lives. They can be mirrors that reflect and validate what's going on in their lives. So I think it's very important that we maintain a rich, but age appropriate level of literature. Thank you, Mr. Blake. So I have an elementary age child, and I only w I don't want him to be reading books that are not appropriate for his age. So I think everybody wants the books to be age appropriate. We have a procedure within the district to approve the books in the first place, which are professionals that look at whether it is uh, <coughs> it has literary com content that is appropriate, et cetera. But we also have a parental objections policy 3006, which provides parents an option to object to curricular materials or books. In addition to that, parents can opt out of books by talking to the teacher of their student on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> we also have a new uh, policy that our superintendent just uh, passed down, that if there's a book in elementary that's going to be read to students that primary focus is gender identity, that the letter, a letter will go out to parents before that book gets read. I 100% support parents having a right to determine what their kids see. I do not believe that parents should be able to control what all kids see. So that's where my line falls. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. Yeah, the, the book banning question to me is really about representation in the schools. And um, I actually you know, have a couple of things that I want to say. I, I obviously don't support book banning, but I do support the idea that parents have the ultimate say in how they educate their children. So you have the right to opt out of material that you don't want your children to be exposed to. I mean, that's just you know something that I'm comfortable with. Somebody else may not be. So let's talk about, for example, like okay to say, you know, I was comfortable with that the material that was provided in that pre presentation. But if I was elected as a trustee, I would completely support a, a parent who is not comfortable with the content um, opting out. So I think it's really important to be upfront about what material is being presented to the children and give parents a lot of time to review the material 
and then get their permission slips to either participate or you have a form to opt out. Um, I also wanted to just add that you are dis doing a disservice to the community that you are trying to represent by making the material age inappropriate or sexually explicit. Thank you. Uh, Mr. So. Kazanowski. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, to be upfront, no, I don't support book banning, but I also support that uh, books need to be age appropriate, relevant to the curriculum that's being taught in our school system. You know, having had two sons that went through the Rochester school system and a grandson currently in the system, I think if there's books that could be considered questionable, that I think those are the times that teachers maybe want to send letters home to parents or contact them and let them know what's being discussed so parents can make an informed decision. Again, I think, you know, there's also like, you know, Mr. Blake says down here, we have an appeals process. If you're not comfortable with the book that's in our school system, you can write a letter to the superintendent and have it reviewed, so and so. We do have library professionals that go over a lot of our books that come through the system. Perhaps there's a collaborative effort between the community partners and our librarians to see what's actually in our, in our libraries and in our schools. But, uh, you know, so I would think on a case-by-case -case basis, if there's a parent that objects to a book, I'm supportive of that. But I don't think they should be dictating what the entire classroom reads. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Luzon. I do not support book banning, but what I do advocate for is parental involvement and consent. Parents should know what their kids are learning. Materials and topics should be easily accessible for review, as many topics could be sensitive to families. We need to foster an environment where education is both inclusive and respectful to all family values. We need to have easy options to opt out, or better yet, opt in for, in for controversial topics. As an elementary school parent, I have yet to see anything regarding books and opting out for my kids. Um, we need to ensure that the books are age appropriate, but that is a, a questionable thing, like who determines what's age appropriate for these kids? Well, their parents. Us parents know our children the best. There's another little fine line uh, recently that I have inquired at school. Kids can bring their own books into the classroom, so we need to set a policy that not only protects the teachers, but also the families who may encounter a controversial topic that has brought, been brought into the class by another student. Thank you. Ms. Annis. So, Teachers want a partnership with parents, and any parent has access to any information and materials that their child is being taught in the classroom. Individual parents do not, however, have the authority to dictate what other children have access to in a classroom or a media center. And as several of my colleagues have said here, we do have a policy in place that, uh, can, that parents can use to object to content. Uh, there also is an opt-out for parents and that's by an individual parent talking with their teacher and having a conversation about something that they don't agree to. Uh, for clarification, we don't have a parent notification policy. We do now require that teachers do let parents know if there is going to be a book so that they can have the option to opt out if it is a gender-focused book. And we also have to be mindful of the subjectivity of a controversial materials policy. Uh, we want our policy to be a shield and not eventually to be used as a sword against our district. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Weaver. As a board member, would you propose... Did I, I'm, Ms. Butel, did I miss you again? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, well, the quick answer is that uh, no, I am not for book banning. Um, and I believe that our, the books that are in our classrooms and in our curriculum need to be age appro appropriate, but also need to be, um, there needs to be diversity in that so that all of our students can see themselves in the books that they're reading, as well as, um, as they like to say, windows into our community to learn about others as well. Um, and I believe, like many have set up here, that parents have the ability to, um, they can talk to the media center about what books they would not like their children to speak or to read or check out. They can also speak with their teachers. And um, most of the teachers that I have experienced in the curriculum nights I encountered, they talked about books and what was in their um, curriculum for the year, and if there were issues, to uh, let them know so that we could, they could speak to them and uh, 
you know, offer alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will start with Mr. Weaver. As a board member, would you propose or require schools to post the Ten Commandments? Why or why not? Repeat it one more time. I just want to make sure I answer it okay. directly. Would you propose or require schools to post the Ten Commandments? I would not propose it or require it. Ms. Osbaugh. I would not propose it or require it because I believe that there is a separation between church and state. We have a diverse community and we need to honor all of the cultures and all of the religions within our community and not single out one to be better than the others. Thank you. Mr. Blake. Ms. Alsbach said it perfectly. No, I would not. Ms. Donnelly. No, I would not support that. Mr. Kazanowski. Uh, no, I would not support that. Uh, having a son that teaches at a, uh, a Catholic school here in Oakland County, you know, we've had this conversation, and even he recognizes that certain things should happen in parochial schools and it's the public schools, that's not a place for that. Back to Ms. Alspa's point, that seeing that, if I'm not Christian, could make me very uncomfortable and make me feel out of place. So, so no, I don't support that being in our schools. Ms. Luzon. Well, unless it's a class on religion that touched base on every religion, <laughs> that included all religions, I would say, sure, that class only, but overall across the schools across the whole district? No, I would not approve that. Thank you. Ms. Annis. We have a system that separates church, church from state, so I would not agree to that. Ms. Butel. The same. I would not want to see those posted uh, just because we have a variety of cultures and religions within our district, and it would not be appropriate to have one over another. And Mr. Cece. No, I do not think they should be posted in schools. It's a disservice to the diversity of people that we have in our district. Thank you. This will be the last, re last question prior to closing remarks. Why do you think Rochester Community School teachers felt a need to negotiate to their contract and academic freedom clause? How do you think this will affect the teachers and learning process will help them or hinder academic achievement. And we will start with Ms. Alspa. So it's my understanding that the Academic Freedom Clause was not new for this contract and has been in the contract. So it wasn't something that the teachers negotiated for this time. Why do we need an Academic Freedom Clause? So that we can fairly represent a wide variety of ideas because our children are going to go out into a diverse community. I've been talking to people in the community and I spoke with a professor at Rochester College, which is a Christian-based college. And she said, well, if you narrow down what they're going to learn in the publication, education, what are they going to do when they get out in the world or when they go into military service and the world hits them in the face? So we need to be able to explore those ideas safely in our classrooms and bring them home and share them with our families and raise children that are ready for the world that they will face. Thank you. Mr. Blake. So the Academic Freedom Clause, um, I believe, started two years ago and it got rolled into this contract. Um, and it's been extremely misrepresented to the public. Uh, the, the freedom is still bound by curriculum, by board policies, by state law. There are, there's all kind of language in there that I read at the board meeting that people are ignoring. Um, but the idea is that each teacher can do their job and teach their subject in the way that they do best, that our teachers are not robots. We're not giving them scripts to where they have to stand up and read only these words and not other words. We want our teachers to be as creative as they can and try to have the freedom to do things. Why do I think this was added? Quite frankly, I think our teachers have been feeling attacked the last couple of years. There have been videos taken in classrooms. There have been countless uh, blog posts about teachers by name. There have been uh, board members who went on Fox News to talk about teachers by name. And I think these teachers feel attacked and rightly so. And they asked for this and I think they deserve it. So as um, 
the two other candidates had stated this wasn't a new clause. It was in the contract in 2022. Um, my, I, I understand why they asked for this clause. Um, my concern with this clause is that it's kind of, I, I don't think it clearly defines the protect, it doesn't protect teachers as well as it could. I think it could be more clearly defined in the contract. Um, I'm actually concerned that uh, about central office, I, I think central office administrators need to do a better job of taking the burden off of teachers with respect to some of the content um, that, that they have been given, you know, freedom to teach with. Um, but I do think that the clause was meant to fill a void in protection. I understand why teachers do feel attacked, and a lot of this, I think, is there's there's a lot of miscommunication, and there's you know the us versus them divide, and I and I really think that we we should try to um, collaborate, have more of a partnership between teachers and parents uh, to mitigate that. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. So good. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, academic freedom in regards to our teachers and our community, I think to the point of the other candidates is that many of them are afraid to actually talk and teach in some of their classrooms because of fear of retribution. However, academic freedom empowers educators to teach a broad curriculum, encouraging students to engage with complex issues and develop their own viewpoints. This freedom nurtures curiosity, innovation, and ability to analyze information critically, skills vital for our success in a rapidly changing world. We must also recognize the challenges. Censorship and political pressures can stifle this essential freedom, limiting access to vital knowledge and hindering students' intellectual growth. When curricula are dictated by fear rather than fostering inquiry, we risk creating a generation that lacks the tools to think independently. We must advocate for policies that support open dialogue, respect diverse viewpoints, and prioritize the integrity of our educational process. By doing so, we not only enrich our students, learning experiences, but also pre prepare them to become informed and engaged citizens. Thank you, Ms. Luzon. So with the academic freedom clause, um, you know, I do agree that teachers should be able to teach how they want inside an approved curriculum, and parents should have access to that curriculum easily accessible. I do agree that the clause is a bit vague, and I feel that we need to work on establishing some policies or guidelines that protect both of our staff and our families. Thank you, Ms. Annis. So as reiterated by a few folks already, um, this clause is bound by curriculum, board policy, and state law. Um, but it also is reasonable for the expectation to be that a teacher shares age-appropriate and relevant information related to that curriculum and the content and the standards that are set for their students without fear of retribution or repercussions from those who don't agree with them. So I, I, I agree with that clause. Thank you, Ms. Butel. Thanks. So academic freedom is the principle that protects our educators um, so that they can explore, teach, and express ideas. And for educators, this means the ability to teach content and encourage discussion without undue restriction. And it helps students learn, question, and engage with diverse perspectives in an open intellectual environment. The purpose of academic freedom is to foster a climate for free inquiry and open debate, which is essential for learning and the development of critical thinking. Academic freedom operates within the bounds of curriculum, maturity level of the students, professional standards, the policies, and the directives of the district. And at the meeting, I know that some teachers stood up and talked about how this allowed them to reach students by being able to um, bring up the topics and the discussions uh, to meet the individual needs of students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cece. I can't really speak on behalf of the teachers who voted for the contract, nor can I speak for those that voted against it, nor can I speak for those that didn't even vote um, on the contract. But what I can say is that um, the opportunities that I've had to speak with a lot of parents, many of them were concerned with the vagueness of the language, and they said that it leaves too much room for interpretation. 
Thank you. Mr. Weaver. The Academic Freedom Clause was added just to the contract after it was voted on after the fact. So it was new. This has not been around for a long time. Our schools have operated for a long time without this clause. So the question is, why do we need it? It was said at the meeting, this clause actually didn't provide any new protections to the teachers. Because again, this is better served in a policy outside of it. This is clearly, the, the academic freedom is clearly concept creep from college universities. Universities actually have academic freedom and are protected under the Constitution different than high school teachers. It's just, that's the law. So again, this goes back to my controversial material policy is saying just outline that we're clear and transparent. What are we covering? Age appropriate, educational, and actually right in the policy, it lays out that teachers are protected because again, they have to sometimes play devil's advocate and says they will be protected when doing that because most of our teachers know how to do this the right way. And we have seen systemically, we are digressing from being able to have open and honest dialogue. So we are not teaching our kids to do that. So to think we put this in the contract and we're all of a sudden going to get that, that's just not reality. Thank you. Mr. Cece. <laughs> Mr. Cece. I'm sorry. Ms. Mutel. That's what they're, oh, I'm sorry. Closing remarks will start with Mr. Weaver. So in closing, um, again, I was actually think most people that watch tonight will see there was a lot of agreement with a lot of positions I had for many people on this table. But yet, again, the narrative out there is somehow I'm an extremist. Somehow I'm presenting, but again, no one's banning books. We're talking about policies. We're talking about build, rebuilding trust with parents, protecting teachers, reducing the wasteful spending in our central office. Those things are not controversial at all. Those aren't extreme in any way. That is all our community is asking for, is we need to, one, we need to modernize and professionalize our central office so we can make it much leaner, return value back to the classrooms, Yes, put the proper guidelines in place. Again, I majored in political science. I could, I could think of some really good high school classes that are definitely would be third rail that I think some of our teachers would love to do. And we can protect them and we can do it right and we can get that done properly. Thank you. Mr. Cece. Uh, thank you again to the League of Women Voters and to our guests who showed up today. In closing, I will offer the following. True transparency isn't just about what happens in the classroom. It's about how our resources are managed and how decisions are made at every level. Parents and taxpayers deserve to see that district funds are being used wisely and responsibly. By building open, honest relationships between parents, teachers, and administrators, we can ensure every dollar is spent where it matters most on our student success. Accountability in our classrooms and at the administrative level is key, and I'm dedicated to ensuring we maintain both transparency and responsible use of our resources. Whether you plan to vote absentee or at the polls on November 5th, I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Ms. Butel. Thank you to everyone who came here tonight to hear from all of the candidates. RCS is an excellent school district, ranked in the top two to 3% of districts in Michigan. We have so much to be proud of, and I'm proud of the work that I've done here over the last 20 years, both in RCS and in our community. During my time on the board, we've strengthened the district's financial health by growing the fund balance, passing a sinking fund, and improving our bond rating all while maintaining fiscal, a focus on fiscal responsibility. We've standardized technology and curriculum across the district, added valuable programs like orchestra and transitional kindergarten, and made significant upgrades and security enhancements to all our buildings. My priority is serving all the students in our district, making sure that our new strategic plan is executed effectively and continuing to improve upon the programs that make our district great. I'm Michelle Butel, and I hope that I have earned your vote so I can continue working to ensure that all students, current and future, have access to an outstanding education in RCS. Thank you, Ms. Annis. Thank you to the League for hosting this forum. I've been honored to serve on this school board for over six years, where we've invested taxpayer dollars into improving our schools and supporting our students. I'm proud to have been a part of initiatives that have directly benefited students, like launching an orchestra program, expanding career technical education, and starting a transitional kindergarten program. 
I've been a part of sustainable and responsible use of public monies with a balanced budget every year I've served, eliminating the, the district's line of credit and increasing our district's rainy day fund. I will continue to champion our successes, address areas where we can and should improve, and support Superintendent Russo. A school board should consist of like-hearted individuals, not like-minded ones, leaders with diverse experiences, but also proven dedication and commitment. Through my advocacy at the state and federal level all for the students, I've shown that I've been engaged where it matters. I'll continue to keep all students at the center of every decision, and I'm Barbanis, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Ms. Lausanne. Again, I appreciate everybody here tonight for attending and considering me for the role as school board trustee. I believe in transparency, collaboration, and listening to all of the community's needs. Together, we can get our schools back on track with a strong educational environment that prepares our children for success in this ever-changing world. I'm asking for your vote to bring fresh ideas and a dedicated voice to the board. We've had six years of frustration. I look forward to a fresh start with a new board to collaborate and work together to build a brighter future for the children. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kazanowski. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters in the city of Rochester Hills for hosting our event. As I stand before you today, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude for the opportunity to share my vision for our schools. Throughout this campaign, I've listened to parents, teachers, and students, and I've heard hopes and concerns. Together, we can build a stronger educational community that prioritizes academic excellence and inclusivity. I believe in the power of collaboration. Our teachers and students are our greatest asset, and I will advocate for their needs, ensuring they have the resources and support necessary to inspire. I also pledge to engage with our support staff, recognizing their vital role in creating a safe and nurturing learning environment. Education is just not about academics, it's about cultivating curiosity, creativity, and character. I'm committed to fostering programs that celebrate diversity and encourage every student to thrive both academically and personally. I've been endorsed by the teachers, the parapros, and the support staff. And as we move forward, let's work together that our schools are places where every student feels valued and empowered. I ask for your support and vote so we can create a bright future for our children. My name is Rich Kazanowski. Thank you. Ms. Donnelly. He doesn't look up. <laughs> so, um, you know, first of all, I just wanted to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this candidate forum. It's just one of two where you get the opportunity to see all of us candidates. So, and thank you to the audience members who came out tonight. I appreciate your taking the time to make an assessment for yourself instead of buying into the online narratives that are circulating. So I, I appreciate all of you. Um, I had a script. I just don't feel like speaking to it right now, so I'm just going to speak from the heart. Um, we're at a critical turning point in our district, okay? And, and we need people who are willing to work with people they disagree with and talk to each other with civility, collaborate, and reach a compromise solution. I mean, that's what we desperately need more than anything on the board right now. And I'm somebody who has, over the years, I've, I've gotten to know many of the people who are sitting at this table, and I'm somebody who would be willing to sit and have a, an active conversation with everybody sitting here. So, you know, please consider voting for me, Tara Dada Donnelly, for the six-year term on Rochester School Board. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blake. Thanks again to the League of Women Voters and to everyone watching. I have a vision for this district that I hope you'll support. A district where our children continue to reach new heights of innovation. Where at the end of this journey, we send our students out to college or the military or to work that are confident and capable citizens ready to meet their destiny. A district where our children have a great childhood, making happy memories and enjoying rich traditions. This type of district cannot happen without an effective partnership between our board, our superintendent, staff, parents, and students. That requires a respect for our educators as professionals and an appreciation for their expertise. I've shown that I can be that type of partner to our administration and to our staff, and that's why our educators have endorsed me. I want to serve this district for the next six years and guide us into a bright future for all of our students. My website is jasonblake.com, spelled with a Y. I hope you'll vote for me then November 5th. Thank you, Ms. Osbaugh. 
So thank you so much to the League of Women Voters and all of the community members that came out and gave us those thoughtful questions tonight. I am an educator endorsed by our educators, and I believe that all of our students deserve the quality education that Rochester Schools has provided for us. All of our students should feel represented in our curriculum, represented in our books, and safe in our classrooms. I'm a graduate of Rochester Schools, as are my three children, two of which who are now serving in the military. I hope that through this honest discussion, um, I have earned the consideration of your vote, and you can learn more about me at juliealspa.com or on my Facebook page. Thank you. We encourage you that this forum gives a snapshot of each candidate. We encourage you to do further research and check on the information that you hear about all candidates. The League of Women Voters would like to thank the audience, the candidates, the City of Rochester Hills for this facility, and Rochester TV for making this forum possible. This presentation is copyrighted by the League of Women Voters, All Rights Reserved 2024. Any recording may only be shown in its entirety. For further nonpartisan information on these candidates, please visit Vote 411.org. Rebroadcast times of this forum will be on the LWV website and also on Rochester TV. The League of Women Voters is funded by contributions from concerned businesses and citizens. Our membership is open to men and women over the age of 16. Remember, in person, early voting begins October 26th through November 3rd and you can vote at your precinct on November 5th. Remember, democracy is not a spectator sport. Thank you and good night.